Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Cedar Falls Board of Education with a reminder that the actions taken at this table this evening will fo focus on our students and their achievement. I want to just point out something. If you walked in the room and we were already engaged in um, a meeting, we actually had a work session prior to the board meeting and we're walking through uh, a book study. Uh, a lot, all of our administrators and staff have been reading um, the book, Grading from the Inside Out. And so we're walking through this too so that we can learn a little bit more about the process, be able to answer questions, and just know where we're heading um, as a district. So that's what we were doing in that half hour prior to the board meeting. Um, moving on to item B on the agenda, the, uh, I'm going to read an affidavit. I have in my possession an affidavit, a publication showing the notice of time and place of a hearing for the 2018-2019 school year calendar that has been published in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on February 14th. The board will now hold a hearing on their proposed recommendations. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to step forward and talk about the school calendar? Doug, would you like to review the recommendation? Um, uh, Andy? Yes, I certainly can. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the uh, calendar is the corresponding date calendar from this current school year. Iowa Code, uh, two years ago, set that school districts cannot start their calendar year before August 23rd, um, and that is something that we certainly always abide by. Um, the, the dates are corresponding for all of our breaks, so our professional development, as well as <clears throat> spring break. However, when you look at the calendar, you'll, you'll say, well, spring break is the third full week in March, and that is accurate. This week, is, or this year, it is the second full week in March. However, we always match our spring breaks with you and I, and they always have their spring break on the 11th Monday of the calendar year. So it just happens to fall that this year, that is the third full week in March. Otherwise, all the dates are corresponding, and the calendar looks very similar to this year's calendar. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we will close the hearing and moving on now to uh, item C on the agenda, public hearing regarding Hanson Elementary Water Main Project. I have in my possession affidavit of publication showing the notice of time and place of hearing to replace the 2018 Hanson Elementary Water Main Project that has been published in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on Febu February 14, 2018. The board will now hold a hearing on the proposed recommendation. Would anyone like to come to the, the microphone and talk about the, the water main at um, Hanson? Would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, the water main at Hanson coming from West 4th Street to the building across the park area um, is roughly 60 years old. Um, it actually broke uh, two years ago, and we did not have a, a day of attendance at Hanson due to lack of water. That was repaired. We do know that because West 4th is going to be replaced by the city this summer, uh, it makes a really opportune time to be able to be as efficient as possible and, and do those projects simultaneously. Um, it uh, saves taxpayer dollars, but also then allows us to replace that water main, which is certainly needed. Thank you, Dr. Patti. If there aren't any questions or comments, then this part of the hearing is closed. Moving on to item D, public hearing regarding elementary furniture. I have in my possession affidavits of publications showing the notice of time and place of hearing for the 2018 elementary school furniture project that has been published in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on February 14th. 2018. The board will now hold a hearing on the proposed project. Is there anyone that would like to come to the mic and speak on behalf of the furniture? Andy? I guess we don't want the furniture to speak, do we? <laughs> no. Well, this is to uh, furnish the new Aldridge Ele Elementary, the additions and remodeling at Orchard Hill in North Cedar. This has been part of the construction plan and, and uh, uh, work from the bond that was approved roughly two years ago. All right. At this time, the hearing will be closed, and we'll move on to item E on the agenda, the consent agenda. 
Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. It's been moved by Susie. Do I have a second? Second. It's been seconded by Sasha. Any questions or comments regarding the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Item F on the agenda is public comment. Uh, Susan, would you like to come first to the microphone and speak? You can just introduce yourself and... Hello, I'm Susan Roberts Dobie, and first let me thank you for the good work that the school board and the superintendent does. I'm the mom of an eighth grader at Holmes and a second grader at Lincoln, but I'm also a professor of health education at UNI. And based on my professional concerns about the health of children and my personal involvement in the Cedar Falls schools, I'm here tonight to publicly pose a few questions about the shift in the special schedule. Um, I only have three minutes, so I'm going to read my comments so I don't digress. It's no surprise to anyone in this room that our kids have health concerns and the specials that you offer help these concerns. Music, physical education, these improve the physical, mental, social, emotional health of kids. They teach the lifelong skills that combat obesity and diabetes and heart disease and anxiety and depression. And while I understand that on paper, this change only takes about 75 minutes of instructional time away from specials, I'm concerned about how this shift will impact not the quantity of minutes, but the quality of how those minutes are delivered. When considering this change, I hope you'll really think about three things. Um, one, again, since this makes sense on paper, but with a shift from two days every six in specials for 35 minutes to one day every four for 45 minutes, um, it's true we only miss 75 minutes, but minutes aren't the only important thing about scheduling. If there's a PE day that's missed because of a late start or because of an assembly, Children will not have PE for a total of seven days in this new schedule. And that means that for two weeks, they'll have um, PE twice a week, and then there'll be three weeks where they'll only see the PE teacher one day a week. Of course, fewer days of contact. Content will also have to be cut from the curriculum because to have a 45-minute period, you can really teach one thing. You can't stop teaching soccer and move on to volleyball for the next 10 minutes. It really changes the way in which teachers deliver content, so please consider the impact on quality. I understand that it's important to control cost as a taxpayer. I appreciate that. Um, and with the opening of this new building, I understand that's an issue, and you have the same number of students, so technically no new teachers. I understand what's going on there. Um, and so I'm wondering about the traveling, and I'm wondering but if that's applying to all positions equally. You know, are we asking janitors to travel? Are we asking secretaries to travel? I'm wondering about these specials teachers and why are we asking them to travel? And so I'm really asking you to consider the excess burden that this puts on teachers and their quality of life in our schools. And third, with the new schedule, as I understand it, all the PE teachers would travel um, as each would have a buddy school. And so no schools would any longer have a PE teacher that's assigned to the building that would have a home school. Every school would be split between two teachers. Um, I have some additional concerns about that, and one is about the relationships with kids. When you are in these classrooms, you see that they know all the kids' names. You go to the concerts, and they know all the kids' names, and splitting them between two buildings is going to change that relationship because it will change their time and their home building. It also will impact their bonus offerings. Um, for PE, that's things like Mileage Club and Dance Marathon. For music, it's things like Culture Club and Music Club and Tinkling Club and the variety shows. And so I'd ask you to consider the impact that has on the students as well. I don't think there's anybody up here that wouldn't say in a perfect world we'd have all the specials, all the days, we'd have all the time for all the math. And I know that's not possible, but it was only a little over 10 years ago that we were offering specials to every five days and then every six. Is that my sound for out of time? <laughs> and so um, now we're going to two every eight. And so I'd just like to say to the school leadership, you know, at one point do we say these specials have been rearranged enough to deliver them in a way that doesn't put a burden on teachers and focuses on their quality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Kim. Kimberly. Your mom called you that. 
<laughs> Only when I was in trouble, right? <laughs> uh, Kimberly Hurley, I'm a new resident to Cedar Falls Community, new faculty at UNI and the Department of Kinesiology, School of Kinesiology. I want to thank you for this opportunity. As the Cedar Falls School District anticipates the opening of a new elementary school, I'm hopeful that discussions and decisions between administration and the school board are well informed. As a physical educator for over two decades, I will speak to the impact that reduced physical education means for Cedar Falls students and teachers. Myth. Reductions in movement time during physical education can be substituted by recess in classroom brain and body breaks. The reality is physical education should not be compared or confused with physical activity. National Society for Health and Physical Educators recommends that schools provide 150 minutes of instructional physical education for elementary school students each week. School physical education programs offer the best opportunities for children to develop key physical, motor, social, and emotional skills. Physical literacy is knowledge, skills, and confidence to move, one of the primary goals of physical education. Children who are not physically literate often choose to engage in more sedentary activities, which puts them at a higher risk for obesity and overweight. We should not assume that our children can become physically literate from brain breaks and recess any more than we can assume our children will become reading literate from providing free time in the library a few times during the school day while reducing purposeful instructional time in reading. Myth, more time spent in high stakes academic coursework, math, sciences, and reading equates to higher academic scores and performance. There has been no research that has consistently supported that, especially at the elementary level. The reality is that research shows strong relationships between fitness levels, physical education, and movement, and academic achievement. Higher fitness levels equal higher scores on academic achievement tests, higher activation in learning centers in the brain after physical ac education and activity is well documented. Strong positive relationships have also emerged between physical education and attention, concentration, on-task behaviors. Oftentimes that means reductions in behavioral challenges, and engagement in high-risk behaviors. Active and healthy students are better learners. Cedar Falls Elementary Schools have reduced physical education for their children from two times every five days in the mid-90s to two times every six days in the 2000s, and now proposed reductions in physical education scheduling to two times every eight days. It appears we may be moving in the wrong direction, especially in light of the importance of this subject for our children. This proposed reorganization will impact the Cedar Falls physical educator's ability to effectively cover critical content to help children become skilled movers, as well as effectively assess mastery. You were discussing that earlier. Curricular units will be reduced to as few as two days per unit. No other academic subject would this be acceptable. We should always remember that our teachers' working conditions are our children's learning conditions. Again, I thank you for your time, but more importantly, the work that you do and the commitment that you show to this community. Thank you for your thank comments. You. Jody, would you like to come up? <coughs> Hello, I am Jody Hickrick, and I'm also a mom of an eighth grader and a second grader, and also have a sixth grader in the district. I am a registered dietitian, um, and I also work for the C -E at UNI, and I've also worked for the Cedar Valley Blue Zones Project. So I'm very passionate about wellness, and I've crossed paths with many of you for those reasons. Uh, I'm here tonight to publicly express my concerns about the shift in specials, uh, the special schedule, and I agree with everything that um, Susan and Dr. Hurley have just said to this point. Um, I want to read a paragraph from the district wellness policy. The district provides a comprehensive learning environment for developing and practicing lifelong wellness behaviors. The entire school environment, not just the classroom, shall be aligned with school district goals to positively influence a student's understanding, beliefs, and habits as they relate to good nutrition and regular physical activity. So my question is, um, does our wellness policy align with um, our actions over the past 10 years of continuing to decrease those number of specials, but specifically then those PE special days. Um, having to possibly change curriculum with decreasing those days, does that affect that lifelong learning skills that have been previously mentioned so far tonight? And I think that something that we forget is environment is the key. 
There is gonna be so many things that the district cannot control related to children's health and obesity, but we can control the environment that our kids are in, which means giving them as much physical activity and those other great specials that they really like too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wyckoff. Well, what have I started up here with this uh, stuff on Monday night? <clears throat> Thank you, very much, everybody, for uh, uh, attending. Uh, Larry Wyckoff, 4241 East Park Road, the great city of Cedar Falls. Does anybody know if Cedar Falls beat Ankeny? They played Indianola. Indianola, whoever it is. Unfortunately, they lost. Ah, so me taking Tony didn't help. <laughs> Rats. Okay, so let me see if I have this right. The Unibomber killed several people, yet the mailbox was, was not blamed for those deaths. Drunk drivers kill thousands of people every year, and again, cars aren't blamed for their deaths. I find it very disingenuous that the NRA is blamed for the deaths of 17 kids and adults when so many laws and rules were broken. I was at hy V just the other day, and someone came up to me and said that the armed school resource officer only attends each school once per month, if that, not daily. So I'm asking, please do something to put an armed school resource officer in each building every school day of the month, rather than playing Russian roulette with our kids and grandkids. Remember, uh, my daughter told me two weeks ago that uh, when she rolled up to Clara's school, there was an armed guard at the school less than 48 hours after the Valentine's Day massacre. If Arkansas can do it, Cedar Falls can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Larry. All right, moving on to communications. Dr. Petty. Yes, before our student liaison comes up, just a, a couple comments. This is always a time to, to, to respond and, and be able to um, talk about some of the comments that were expressed with the board, and we greatly appreciate the comments and people advocating, advocating on behalf of education, so thank you for that. Um, as I think uh, people are aware, we are exploring, no final decisions have been made, but looking at as we open up Aldrich Elementary, what do we do with our, our scheduling? How do we become as efficient as possible focusing on the needs of all students. So we are exploring, moving from a six-day cycle to a four-day cycle. Um, I think there, are, there is some confusion. People lumped all specials together. There are some specials that meet right now once every six days. Um, so actually, if we go to a four-day cycle, they would meet more frequently and for more time. So we want to make sure that we're looking holistically and not saying which is going to be uh, um, uh, received more time or necessarily less time because PE was spoken uh, about several times in this conversation. Right now we have some PE sections and grade levels that actually would increase going to a four-day section or a four-day schedule, excuse me, because if you look, do the math, we have some PEs that meet for 30 minutes in some buildings at some grade levels. They meet one every six days, so they'd meet for a total of 60 minutes in a six-day cycle or a 120 minutes in a 12-day cycle. If we go 45 minutes in a four-day cycle, they would meet three different times during that time the time frame. They'd have 135 minutes, so they'd actually increase 15 minutes in those 12 weeks, or excuse me, 12 days within that cycle. There are some sections of PE that meet for 35 minutes every two times every six days, so they would lose some time over the entire course of the year, about 75 minutes. But again, we would increase art, we'd increase some other uh, uh, specials with, with some uh, much needed time in those other areas that meet very infrequently. I think the other caveat to this is as we look at a six day cycle, we are not able to be able to have grade level teams meet collaboratively together during those special times. And as we looked at moving towards a four day cycle compared to a six day cycle, we are able to actually maximize some efficiencies to be able to have grade levels grade level teams meet together uh, to talk about student uh, growth, to talk about student uh, achievement, to really focus on those areas of need as we look at helping students that struggle or accentuating those students that already uh, have achieved or learned at high levels to make sure that we're challenging them deeper. 
I think the final component, and, and this was brought up by I think one or two speakers, uh, traveling teachers. Um, currently we have several teachers in special areas that don't travel. Next year, if we do go to a four-day cycle, we'll still have several specialist teachers that won't travel. Um, however, what we're trying to create in a more equitable format is we have some teachers that will go to multiple buildings, in fact, sometimes three buildings. We think that it's better to be able to create buddy buildings, so once we do look at shifting or we do shift, then there's only a teacher that would go between two buildings, not three buildings, or potentially more buildings, and we're trying to uh, maximize that efficiency. It's really based on number of sections taught, number of students impacted, to make sure that's equivalent and equates across our district uh, in a very equitable manner. So yes, no, no decisions have been made. We're looking at this. Wellness, health, safety of our students, extremely important, as we all know. Um, but also are the other specials that we know are as important for student learning, that well-rounded approach to help all students be successful when you look at all those different areas. Student safety and security, now the caveat to the other aspect, um, our school resource officer goes to buildings much more frequent than once a month. Um, we have a great relationship with our police department. We have uh, uh, members of the police department within our buildings uh, all the time and, and certainly invite them in all the time. And I would say that is one of the greatest strengths that we have as we look at safety and security. We have a great relationships with our city, with our county, with all the different first responders that we could possibly have. And that certainly is a, a very good feeling as a superintendent, as a parent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that spoke this evening. We appreciate it. Uh, moving on to our student board representative, Arlo. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, so since our student senate dance marathon is complete um, and we don't really have another big project um, before spring break, um, I just wanted to talk about some of the exciting things happening with our student organizations right now because this week or two period is a busy time and there's a lot of really cool things happening and that have happened and I wanted um, to speak about a few of those. Um, last weekend, Cedar Falls High School students were very successful in the individual district speech competition. Um, most of those students are moving on to the state competition, which is very exciting. Um, the Cedar Falls High School Democrats organized a peaceful protest on our day off of school last Friday. Obviously, um, there are conflicting opinions even when this <coughs> within this room, but I think we can all agree that students, you know, understanding and getting involved in politics is ultimately a beneficial thing for our community. Um, this coming weekend, coming week, um, and unfortunately our women's basketball team did lose today, but um, getting to compete in the state tournament obviously is still very exciting and um, it was a great honor for them to be able to participate. And our men's team is looking tomorrow to continue to advance to the state tournament as well. Um, our spring play, Around the World in 80 Days, is performing this Friday and Saturday at 7.30 in the auditorium. Um, and our robotics team, the Sort Dogs, has their first competition of the season in North Dakota this weekend. So um, I know in the next few meetings I'll have more to talk about from Student Senate, but I wanted to share some of those things happening at the high school. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Good luck this weekend, Arlo, thank with you. the play. We mm -hmm. wish you the best. Um, thank you for coming and representing the student body. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, Arlo. Moving on now to the CAPS, Technology and Engineering Strand. I think Maria is going to come up and kind of introduce not only herself, but some of the, the background with the CAPS program. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, well, thank you for having me. So, again, my name is Maria Perez, and I am the instructor for technology and engineering. I've been the instructor for just one semester. This is my second semester. But this is the strand that actually started CAPS, and Ethan Wickman was instructor for the first semester. So... I am here with a couple associates, one of them who took it last semester and one of them who's taking it right now. And I'm also here with Monica Gerdes from Viking Pump, uh, which is our host site. So we all talk and then later, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer any. But I just wanna give you a summary of what we have achieved since 
I am here. And this is just quick, but these were the um, associates last semester. We had 10 of them, and in total we pr completed 15 projects. CAPS works uh, by, the model is that we do projects for community members, uh, organizations, etc. So we had 15 uh, projects. All the associates got trained in a project management uh, strategy called Agile or Scrum. Uh, they all build a resume, and that resume is actually reviewed by professionals, like human resources people. They all have interview opportunities to have mock interviews, like if they were getting a real job. And again, that's done by professionals in the field that give them good feedback on how to answer different questions. They all uh, complete a LinkedIn profile, have two to three job, job shadows done, and that's with the idea of getting more career exploration. Hopefully having them really ask the good questions they should ask before deciding to go to college for four years or two years, whatever they're going to do. And they all presented the final experience and a lot of you were actually there in that presentation. But that was important for them to, to get some of these um, professional skills, communication skills going. So that was last semester. This picture is actually from today and we were missing a couple people for the basketball game. But um, uh, we're 11 right now. We're kind of hosting two more so we're about 13 because two are doing projects from the communication strand with us. So right now we have pretty full house, but it's really fun. Two of them are from Waterloo East and they're excellent. It's great partnership with Waterloo as well. Right now we have seven ongoing projects and so far we all have got certified, or not certified, but trained with Agile and Scrum and that's, um, really important for us because we just hand the associates, they choose projects and they have to decide how to manage those projects. So that's a really important thing for them to get to do. Uh, we had a tour at UNI so far with the technology Department of Technology and we had have at least one guest speaker uh, last, last week uh, from Dalton uh, Plumbing just talking about the trace and opportunities that. So, so far that's what we have done. And this, I'm not gonna read it all, but I just wanted to put there uh, and name some of the mentors that we have had. We really, uh, the teaching doesn't come from me. I mean, rarely it comes from me. It comes a lot from different mentors. And without the community help, then we could not do that. So I would like to invite all of you to really, if you can help with anything you want, if you wanna come and talk about human resources, you're welcome to come. Uh, about anything that you want, it, ideas with projects or mentorships is what we really are always looking for. And I just put here some of the logos of people that we've been doing projects with, uh, and hopefully this is gonna keep growing, and also some mentors that have helped us a lot. And definitely Viking Pump has been our main supporter. Uh, we're hosted there, but they also give us lots of mentors and projects. So I also want to do a big shout out to them for supporting us so much. And I think that's it. Any questions for me right now? Any questions for Maria? Good. So I'm going to have them. <laughs> if there's any questions later, I'll be back. Okay. Thank you for your work, Thank you. Maria. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Chim Zmbonda, and I was part of the CAPS Tech and Engineering strand last semester, so I'm no longer in CAPS. I heard about the CAPS program through Ethan Weekman. He was my old math teacher, and then he became the CAPS instructor. So he lobbied a bunch for me to join the CAPS program, and I ended up taking the CAPS program through the great things that he said CAPS could offer me. My expectations coming into the CAPS program was that it was gonna be a form of internships and job shadows, meaning that we would pick up projects for them, but they would kind of guide our hand down the way to for the projects. But in reality, I worked with Envision Architecture and they gave me a project to do, and they gave me the reins. They told me I could either choose one survey or the other survey, and it was up to my choice, not that they were taking my hand down it. I was part of three main projects during my time in CAPS, and the first one was promoting CAPS at teacher, teacher conferences. So me and Maria went to Waterloo West during their teacher conferences, and we did an elevator pitch to anyone who came by at our stand and pitched CAPS to them, so that way not only were Cedar Falls kids getting involved in the CAPS program, but Waterloo kids as well. The second project, project I was part of was for Envision Architecture, and we were given the task of 
creating a survey for students and staff that found the hopes, wants, needs, and fears, as well as how the building was utilized and what the student body and staff members wanted to see in the new school and what was missing. The last project I was part of was creating a mixed reality scene for the administration building, and they wanted this to be implemented into classes. So if you can see on the right-hand side the picture, that's a student that's inside the mixed reality scene, and so he's actually in the environment. So not only are you seeing what he sees, but you see everything around him. And this could have been beneficial because I took anatomy and physiology last year, and one thing that students kind of found trouble with was understanding the difference between smooth muscles and skeletal muscles under the microscope. And so if our teacher could have put on the HTC Vive headset and gone through this, she could have showed us the differences rather than everyone sitting at the microscope and having to wait for it to come around and then point out the differences to us. All in all, I think CAPS was beneficial for me because it helped me with my communication skills. Before I took CAPS, I was kind of a quiet kid and I kind of stuck to myself, but through CAPS, I've not only been able to communicate better through verbal communication, but also professional communication through emails. I've understand I've understood the importance of first impressions and networking. I've been able to get my networking out there while my, in my time during CAPS as well as out of CAPS so I can reach back on those networks later in life and my accountability because during CAPS you pick up real projects and if you don't meet your deadline for the project, there's a consequence that happens because in school you get structured for, well, everyone's in this group project, it's due by this day, but then if you don't get it done, they tell you, well, okay, you won't present today, you'll present once you guys have it done, but in the real world, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, but if you guys have any questions that I could answer, now would be the time. Any questions? Have you had students come and talk to you about CAPS, Jim's and other students who have either been thinking about it or don't know what it is? I mean, are you able at the school during your day to kind of be our, one of our advocates out there? Yeah, I've actually had a lot of people that have come up to me and talked to me specifically about CAPS. They've asked me what the coursework, what the course load is like, uh, the different type of businesses that you get to be involved with, how it's structured, because uh, I went in the lunchroom to do the Envision project, and so a lot of people saw what CAPS was firsthand, and it kind of got a lot of more people engaged. And so I've had a lot of people since then come up to me asking what it's like, how it's structured, and how they can get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm Zach Brady, and I'm from the Technology and Engineering Strand in CAPS this semester. Uh, I first heard about CAPS when I was walking down uh, the hallway to the library and I saw a poster uh, to the left of me that had a table surrounded by kids that I knew from school at a place called Viking Pump. And I read the description on the poster and at first I didn't think much about it. But then a few weeks passed and it was time for scheduling and I looked, uh, I looked up a video on what the CAPS program was because I saw it again. And I knew right then that it was something that I'd be interested to take. Uh, I didn't really know what to expect going into the school year, but I had heard mostly positive things about CAPS, so I wasn't worried at all. Uh, the new semester started and we began our projects almost immediately. Uh, the first project our group did was a promotion for CAPS and Viking Pump itself. Uh, one group did, let's see, one group did an announcement over the intercom at the high school. Uh, another group, oh, I forgot I had slides. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> This was a picture I saw, by the oh. way. <laughs> so this was the first uh, project we did. Uh, like I said, it was just a promotional piece. So me and my group decided to make a song for uh, the CAPS program, properly titled program. Uh, and the song is linked right there. Um, the best part to me about this whole thing was that I was able to use my interest in music to promote the program. And it's reached almost 400 people over multiple platforms. So it not only brought a bunch of good publicity to the, to the CAPS, but at the same time, it was fun for me and my group. Uh, so that was really good. Uh, what I'm working on right now is a seed sorter for the UNI Tallgrass Prairie Center. Uh, I'm using my experience with Autodesk from the Project Lead the Way courses at the high school uh, to make parts that will help direct smaller, seed, smaller amounts of seed into a set of gears and it'll disperse evenly. Uh, and this is needed because they, uh, they have smaller 
projects and right now their setup is too big and so they need smaller funnel systems and so I'm building that. Um, but we're still making prototypes, me and my partner Taylor. Uh, but the printers so far haven't really wanted to cooperate, as you can see. <laughs> so, but we're still working on it. Uh, and then the last project I'm a part of is at Crichton Metalworks right here in Cedar Falls. And we're going to be using a program called uh, SolidWorks. I have a slide for that one too. Yeah, so we're going to be using a, pro uh, a program called SolidWorks. And we're going to be making a uh, motorized rotating table for them to be able to finish their metal parts uh, with, that, with as little effort from the operators as possible. Uh, and this will decrease the risk and save production time for the company. So there's a lot of projects that will keep our hands full every day. Uh, my closing thoughts on the CAPS program uh, is that it's completely exceeded my expectations in terms of productivity, experience, and networking. Uh, I'm able to talk to actual business owners in the local area and use my talents to complete projects that actually benefit their company. Uh, no other class offers that experience, and that's what makes this program so special to me. Uh, a quote that I think fits what CAPS is trying to do was said by Steve Jobs, and it reads, great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people. And I've seen firsthand how true that is with the CAPS program. Thank you. Mm. And I can, I can entertain any questions, too. <laughs> Any questions? So why did you select the two projects that you're currently working on with uh, you and I and Crichton? Um, because they both sort of, SolidWorks is very similar to Autodesk Inventor. So, and I was used to doing that from Project Lead the Way. I, I, was, I took IED SIM and now POE this year. So I have a background in 3D modeling. And so I figured I fit that the most. That's good, thank you. Can you tell us how you, the projects were pitched to you? Um, so the song we decided to do by ourselves, uh, but let's see, the tall grass, Maria, she, she reached out to us about that. Uh, Justin Meissen is a representative from the tall grass prairie center and he reached out to us about this, the seed sorter. And for Crichton, we actually just did a tour at the, at Crichton last week and he just gave us the rundown. So we're starting that soon. Great. Any other questions? I just wanted to say, not a question, but a comment that both of your um, public speaking skills are yeah. very strong, and uh, I, I imagine that some of that is, uh, you know, some of that credit is goes to the CAPS program. So, yeah, Maria, <laughs> thank you. Oh. Tremendous, great job. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you so much sure. for your work. Tonight. <laughs> My name is Monica Gertis. I'm the talent engagement business partner at Viking Pump. Um, I appreciate you all inviting me to speak tonight um, and also really wanted to just thank you um, for supporting such an innovative program that connects students not only with businesses within the community but also um, network opportunities with the Waterloo School District as well. Um, so I um, am the liaison for the CAPS program with Viking Pump and I've had the opportunity actually to start at Viking Pump the same day CAPS did, so I know no different. Um, but I've seen a lot of successful things come out of that, and so just one project that I'd like to kind of speak to um, from a Viking Pump perspective was um, a project last semester with virtual reality um, software. And so that is some software that we um, purchased as um, an opportunity to engage kind of our distributors and our customers to be able to see firsthand how our um, pumps would work within their applications without actually having to um, go to the site or um, start with a prototype pump. And um, so I don't believe that project was able to get quite to completion, but that's not something that um, we would have been able to tackle with our employees and their current workload. And so this was something that um, we were able to kind of embark on that we wouldn't normally have been able to otherwise. Um, and it also gave our associates a great opportunity to work on problem solving outside of just the uh, technical project at hand, um, but working within networking in um, kind of a corporate setting. Um, so we had to work actually very closely with our corporate IT team that works out of Chicago to work on getting approvals um, for the system um, as it's a gaming software. So I, that was a great thing um, in addition to just the technical problem solving itself. 
And then the other project that I'd really like to speak to is a project also that came out of last um, semester using our 3D printer and additive manufacturing. Um, so one of the associates was able to 3D print some parts and we actually realized a cost saving um, using those parts being 3D printed versus going through the traditional manufacturing process. So um, definitely a valuable program. Uh, we really appreciate the partnership that we have at Viking Pump and you all supporting um, that program for the students. Are there any questions I can answer for you about the partnership with Viking Pump or projects that associates have worked on for us? I think the most important thing to say is thank you to Viking Pump. Uh, you took a leap of faith with us last year about this time to say we would love to be the first host site and we couldn't have asked for a better host site. So thank you so much for your investment, not only in our students, but our community as a whole. Absolutely. And I just want to remind our community that when you're talking about your associates, our associates, you're talking about our students, correct? Not yes. your professional colleagues at work, but our students are your associates. Correct. And I, I love that you referenced what Shimson had mentioned and um, that both students mentioned was these are real life, real projects that you need done for your company and they're out there um, not just doing things, it's not just busy work, it's not just a job shadow, they're actually contributing. Absolutely, there's definitely a beneficial impact. Um, and also on the professional networking side, I don't know how many other 17 or 18 year old students you would hear talking about an elevator speech and understanding the importance of that. So, I mean, kudos to the CAPS program and the instructors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank all of you for yes. being here this evening. And we have seen growth. Um, your speak, just to Eric's point, um, your speaking skills have just blossomed over this past year. And I am so impressed and so proud about each and everything that you do within CAPS and how you're supporting it, how you're willing to go out and talk about it, but what you're doing with the partners that you are engaged with. So kudos to you and, and thank you for being here this evening. All right, moving on now to Janelle to talk about our newsletter. Yep, a few things um, to update the board on. It was already mentioned by Arlo, but yes, the um, Women's basketball lost by one point. Mm. Oh, it was a heartbreaker. But they were back to back to back to back appearances at the state tournament. So congratulations to Coach Crone and all the um, athletes. Three of the starters will actually be playing for UNI women's basketball next year. So it'll be very exciting to follow their careers. But congratulations to them. Although I'm sure they're not probably wanting to hear congratulations tonight yet. But maybe tell them tomorrow morning. <laughs> Um, a couple other things. So the Math Counts comp competition is something that Pete and Holmes both participate in. And it was just last week, Pete Junior High placed second um, at the chapter competition and they move on to state. And then they also had two individuals place in the top 10. And one of those individuals is actually a sixth grader from Southdale. So you'll see all of those students there. And then also the Holmes team, they placed third, and then they had five individuals placed in the top 10. So if you take the two from Pete and then the five from Holmes, we had seven of the top 10 individual place winners within the Math Couts competition, and then they'll all also go on to the state competition. Also, we had a spelling bee. We had lots of students that participated in this and those smiling faces, man, you can tell they were excited. So this was fourth, fifth you see right here in this slide and then also sixth and seventh in this next slide those are the winners and it was um, done by the local knights of columbus and then each of the buildings had kind of preliminary rounds to be able to actually compete then at the spelling bee so then this shows the winners or the top five of each of those grade levels so congratulations to those students and all of their names are in the e-newsletter so if you don't get the e-newsletter you can go to our website and, and look it up also, um, once again, it seems like every year we have at least one or two students that win with the Know Your Constitution competition. It's done by the Iowa State Bar Association at the state level. This is actually a student from West High School. On the left and on the right is Zoe Edgington from Holmes Junior High, and they both won a trip to Washington, D.C. with their instructor um, to go and because of their winning essays that they did for the Iowa State Bar Association contest. Couple things, these are, these are not like big congrats here, but this is parents, good things for you to know for your kids. 
Um, especially at the high school level, we want to make sure they know they need to know their balance before they're getting their a la carte items in the line. Oh. Um, it, this is, you know, one of those important things that this may be the best way to let parents know, to let their students know, make sure you know what that balance is before you're buying a la carte there in the line. Well, you look over my way. Is that <laughs> I was just, I, yeah, no, not, not, not towards you at all, Eric. <laughs> uh, another just kind of bit of information, so our boundary map was updated a couple years ago um, officially then by the board this past fall, of course you all know that, it will take effect within the fall 2018 school year. The boundary map is posted on our website under About Us School Boundary Maps. You can find this um, image right here. And this shows the adjustments that will be made in regards to Aldrich coming online. And then it also shows, um, it's kind of difficult to see, but the red line indicates how then those schools feed into the junior highs. So Aldrich will be, the, of course, our seventh elementary, but we're splitting that with the two elementaries. Um, for space reasonings primarily, but that map is now updated and there for anyone that would like to be able to see that. And talking about 2018, our kindergarten parent meeting will be taking place um, Tuesday, March 20th at, at the elementary buildings. Your child would be attending, except for Aldrich, not quite ready for um, meetings there yet, but so that meeting will be take place at the district administration center, which is just off West First Street. And again, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media channels for the district and at the building level. Any questions? Questions for Janelle. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Okay, moving on to item H on the agenda, Secretary's financial report. Mr. Nisker. Well, I don't know how I'm supposed to follow all this information. I'm just a silly man who just reads numbers off of a PowerPoint. But, uh, we'll go through the financial reports for the month of January, if uh, we can bring those up. There we go. Um, general fund for the month of January, you can see uh, revenue and expenditures are pretty much a regular, normal January month, not much to report. Uh, our ending balance of uh, $7.54 million. Uh, in the management fund, uh, we had a revenue of a little over 18,000, no expenditures in the month of January, so our ending balance is uh, just under $800,000. Uh, capital projects fund, uh, you can see the revenue, that's all interest on our investments for the month and expenditures of 1.49 million. Of course, that's for the three elementary projects that are currently taking place. So we have an ending balance of about 16.7 million in that fund. Uh, Fund 33, the statewide one cent sales tax fund. Uh, we had revenue of 825,000. Again, the state of Iowa and in its infinite wisdom is sort of on this. We'll make two payments in one month, no payments the next month cycle now. Um, so you can see 825,000 for revenue for the month. Uh, expenditures, uh, 14,000. Uh, that uh, would be expenditures associated with some work with the new high school that we're kind of exploring on that. And then the, the transfer into Fund 40 for our debt service payments. And then you can see an ending balance of uh, just under $8.4 million. Uh, fund 36, the Pebble Fund, uh, revenue and expenditures as shown. Uh, the big thing with the expenditures, uh, we made a roughly a three quarters payment to the University of Northern Iowa for the tennis court project. So that's where the majority of uh, that, those dollars went for the month. And you can see an ending balance of just under uh, 3.2 million in the Pebble Fund. Uh, debt service, uh, revenue for the month, again, that's uh, property tax and interest. And then that's, there's that transfer in from Fund 33. Uh, there'll be no expenditures until the June payment, uh, it's due June 1st. So our ending balance is uh, just a little over $1.9 million. Uh, student activity fund, pretty normal for the month of uh, January and an ending balance of $592,000. Uh, trust and agency, again, a re relatively normal um, activity for the month of January, about $221,000 in the checkbook for that. Uh, food service, again, uh, pretty regular, normal activity for the month of January with a balance of as 684,000. Uh, the coffee shop fund at the high school, you can see it's got a balance of $7,700. And in the uh, River Hills Consortium Fund, 
uh, as those second quarter tuition bills are now starting to flow, and you can see the in and out with that, and then there's a current balance of a little over 33,000, but that was uh, expended here in February, so that uh, theoretically that would be a zero if there was any other activity. And with that, I would entertain any questions from the board. And just to clarify, because you had mentioned new high school, um, the, the expense that we had, the board had we'd reviewed that earlier in the year regarding um, planning stages. That's correct. Things planning for the future. So yeah, that, that expense would be for the, the, the planning activities that are currently taking place. Okay, great. Any other questions for Doug? Hearing none, if not, the Secretary's financial report will be placed on file for audit. Now we're on to the information report, science. I'm not sure who starts or <laughs> begins this. Um, however, typically we're about 10 minutes into our meeting right now, so thank you for being here for <laughs> the last uh, 52 minutes. We greatly appreciate you holding with us and very excited about the, the science report, so thank you. Well, I'm Amanda Johnson. I'm, I'm the department chair over at Holmes Junior High. I'm Hillary Eel, and I am the instructional technology coach at Pete Junior High. Lisa Johnson, um, instructional coach at Holmes Junior High, former science teacher. Lynn Griffin, I'm up at the high school department chair. And we are here to talk a little bit about our work the past couple years regarding NGSS, which are the Next Generation Science Standards. They were adopted in August of 2015, and since then we've been working to determine how these standards will be brought to our students and how we are going to make sure that they get all of these standards from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. Obviously, we're focusing on the secondary level, so we've been meeting more as a team of 7th through 12th grade science teachers to determine how we will roll out these new standards. As the slide says, these specific standards are outlined by grade level from kindergarten all the way through 8th grade. After eighth grade, it changes, and then it's in content bands, so more specific physical science, earth science, um, and physical earth and life science standards. As far as what our work has consisted of, it's been deciding how we want to break up the content bands for the ninth through 12th grade levels. So NGSS is proposed as a three-dimensional learning um, cycle, I guess, and really it's composed of three different components, and it will definitely change the way that science material is covered in science classes. The three different parts are science and engineering practices. This is what we want students to be able to do. So it's something that they're going to be doing in the classroom, and there are eight different science and engineering practices, such as developing and designing models, conducting and planning investigations, analyzing data using mathematics as well, creating arguments and claims based with evidence, and the last part is defining problems and solutions, more of an engineering practice. Another component of the three-dimensional learning is cross-cutting concepts. These are applications that they're going to see across all science disciplines, so it's a way to really integrate all of the information. This is what we want students to understand, that you know, there are these connections across all science concepts, such as patterns, you're gonna see cause and effect in a lot of different sciences, structure and function, energy and matter, stability and change, systems and system models. So there's seven of those. And then the last part is the actual disciplinary core idea. This is what we want students to know. So this is more of the actual content, and it's going to be specified by different grade levels. Again, it's going to incorporate the, all three of those content areas, life, physical, and earth and space science, plus the engineering technology piece as well. And the performance expectations are how they're written now. Again, the focus on all three of those integrated parts rather than memorizing science facts.
we got to catch up down here. <laughs> All right. Um, on your screen is a timeline of the um, work that we've been doing as 712 science teachers, and it's a super detailed um, look at what we've been doing. We've had a lot of PD starting back in the spring of 2016 um, up through last Friday with our professional development. And just to kind of highlight that, um, one of the things that we've been doing is we started with this learning about it piece and figuring out what do we need to know in order to change our structure maybe and implement it. Um, and then we started with some action in uh, February of 2017 to say this is what we're going to do. We started taking some professional development that um, Lynn Griffin brought to us with um, these are some ways and some different resources that we can use, um, working with different phenomena or a uh, claim evidence reasoning method. Um, so we started taking some of the action steps. Next fall, we will be implementing 7th and 8th grade courses. And then the following fall, 2019, it will be 9 through 12. Some of the work that we've been doing is taking what NGSS offers us, which is taking those standards and all three dimensions and breaking those down and putting it into um, words that our students can understand and we can understand. Um, taking it and looking at what do we want our kids to know and be able to do. So really taking these really in-depth, very complex standards and breaking it down. Um, I know in eighth grade, I think it's 23 different standards. So they've, they've done this 23 different times. So taking that work and then going through and listing out what are our guiding questions? How are we going to direct our search for learning for our students? What kinds of questions do we want them to be able to answer? And hopefully, what kind of questions will they be asking throughout this process? Next thing on there is learning targets, breaking down the standard even further into I can statements, into what can we do on a daily basis and how can um, this work drive my instruction daily, as well as how can my students know where they're at formatively before we get to the end task. Because these are extremely packed things um, that are very complex and need to be broken down. Oh, yeah. And we're doing learning based grading with it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have this one slide, but um, this is um, a, a teachers, a group of teachers who worked on a unit plan. And so um, once they've unpacked that standard, then they have to kind of build that curricular map and, and that um, plan for actually what they're going to do in the classroom. So this is um, a take, taking a look of what that looks like. Um, the teams would um, have a common assessment that they would be giving both at Pete and Holmes for our seventh and eighth graders for next year. And um, that they would also have the criteria clearly there, a, a rubric, so that the students knew what the learning target was and that there was some um, accuracy in how they would be assessing that um, using the, the learning-based grading and criterion referenced um, um, kind of plan that learning-based grading does. So when we look at this from the big picture now, all this work that we've done, you know, really we all started as a large 712 department and we're so idealistic, like this is a perfect world, this is what we're going to do. Then we had to take a step back and say, wait a minute, we believe in our heart and we know that we have given our students in the past a great science experiment. So we did not want to walk away from all the good work we've been doing. So we took a step back and said, all right, so let's take this ideal plan. Let's take what we currently do and let's make a plan that works best for our students. And it wasn't easy to get there. You saw that one slide with all the different things that we've been doing. But to me, it was the most amazing work because I've been in this district for 23 years. And this is the first time that I've seen 712 science teachers come together, work so hard, and agree on what we wanted to do. Not that we've always had disagreements, but we've never really gotten together that much and been able to look at it in such depth. And I really believe that this plan that we have is in our best interest for our students. I wish my own kids had gone through this. 
What it gives them is a great background, starting out at seventh and eighth grade as integrated, all the different sciences. Then as ninth grade, getting that earth science and physical science. And then the choices really begin for our high school students. When we look at the different pathways that they could take, we are gonna maintain our honors level and our regular level because it's about what career path are they looking at. So we still wanna be able to challenge them and help them in a direction that helps them where they wanna go in life. And maybe they don't know. And so we're still giving them that broad background to help them figure it out. So as you can see from this matrix, they are gonna take after the earth and physical science, a biology course, whatever it might be, and then they're gonna take a chemistry course and a physics course. Now, if they are going into a math and science field, those are the ones that are gonna go into that honors track. Those are business or anything else that they're gonna go into, that's the other track. And so right now, we're doing the work on designing two courses the chemistry one and the physics one, which will be semester courses taking the performance expectations that were identified, and we're making real life application science. What I want my son or daughter to walk out of here and say, you know what, I'm gonna use that science in my real life. Not the theoretical stuff, not all that information that you always ask, well, what am I gonna do with this? No, they're gonna do it. These are gonna be project-based courses for real life science. So I think that's gonna be one huge change at the high school. And then we'll still be offering our semester courses, all of our AP courses to allow those students to build on areas of interest. We're even looking at changing some of our semester courses to see and trying to hit some of those interests that our students have. So we're recommending that those students take that, you know, they've taken that ninth grade in the junior high and then a biology course and then that chemistry course and physics, whatever it might be at their level. And we're confident, do I just click this? There we go, oh, I went wrong. So we're confident that when our students are done, they're gonna have a good foundation in the biology, chemistry, physics, and earth science. So these students are gonna go into the world and they're gonna be in our society making decisions and as far as the science goes, those are gonna be educated decisions. They have put a ton of work into this. Yeah, and yeah, if, it's very clear. I, I don't think I ever took a picture of the conference room B notes after one of your meeting. There was <laughs> strands and standards and it was amazing. The, the level of work, it was about two months roughly yeah. just because we were enamored by it and, and how deep it was. So again, it, it's been very impressive, the work that you've done. So thank you so much for you and all of your teammates. I guess questions before we move to the elementary. Were you satisfied with the, with the uh, NGSS? Do you think the process that, uh, that science curriculum developers went through, were, uh, was it a pretty robust process? And are you generally satisfied with those standards? Yeah. <laughs> I know why they're doing this. I've done, gone through two summer trainings on the NGSS through you and I that have helped us understand where this all started. And yes, the foundation of this, super strong. Getting at what we want our students to be able to do, not Google. And so that's that big push. And all the professional development that we're working on now and forward is to help us make that transition in our classroom about getting away from that Googling and looking it up to, Modeling, developing, modeling, and developing. That's the big foundation for it. Any other questions or comments? Well, I, I, got, I got to witness you all working on this at one point and was just absolutely so impressed. So thank you. I know the hard work that goes into all of it. Um, I, I wanted just to ask quickly about the project-based courses. Are, are there going to be opportunities for external partnerships to help with some of those projects you might be working on? That's our goal. Yeah. We're, like I said, we're working on them now, so mm -hmm. we'll probably be asking <coughs> for advice and input around our department and in all the other areas to see how we could bring that kind of, uh, I don't know, how we bring that into our classroom because it's something that most of us aren't used to doing. Right. So yeah. we'll, we'll come talk to you. Yeah, yeah, excellent. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank I'll you. I'll add just a quick comment, too, because two years ago when we first started this work, 
sitting down and looking at, uh, you know, we knew that the NGSS standards were probably going to become the Iowa science standards, and so we, it was not an option for us that we needed to move in this direction. Uh, but it really, when we looked at what we were requiring kids to, to complete before they graduated from the high school, we saw there were some huge gaps. And the biggest hurdle was how do we fill those gaps but maintain the flexibility and the choice options for our students at the high school. And I think they've done an outstanding job of putting together a plan that gets at those essential learnings that we want every student to come out of Cedar Falls High School with but still provides those students with some options that they might have interests or passions in as they move through. So kudos to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know two years ago everybody was shaking their head thinking this is going to be a tough road, but uh, you look back now and just say it's been a lot of work, but you, you've done an outstanding job with it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I just I want to thank you guys for coming and presenting to us because I think sometimes when we talk about standards and things like that, people just hear the political rhetoric that surrounds it and it sounds like it's mandated and it's handed to us and then you just open the book and start teaching. But it's good for you to come and tell us what your process is, that you're actually the ones deciding how we are meeting those standards and the content that is being delivered and how that's being delivered. So it still gives you the autonomy to give our students the best of all options. So, and I love the real world part of the science that you're talking about. So thank you for coming. Great job. Good job. One more plug quick, because uh, I see Jason sitting back here. You know, Jason uh, Wedgbury uh, really took on the task of, of helping be the facilitator as, as our administrative team uh, with the science. And he had experience both at uh, Pete Junior High and then at the high school. So he had a, a good perspective of, of a lot of that as we moved through. So I wanted to thank Jason for his work on it as well. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. So this is like the, that was the mic drop, I should say. And so I'm just going to share a little bit of our journey, too, um, at the elementary level. So K through 6, um, what I've done, um, we actually have adopted um, a program called STEM Scopes. And I just want to talk a little bit about how we got to that point. Kind of like Dan said, we knew the writing was on the wall with these standards, and we were really excited to get to know them because we had science that was just kind of all over the place and not really consistent in the district. So we started um, engaging with some uh, study of the standards and really those shifts in the instruction clear back in 2015 as well. Um, we had a couple of um, consultants from AEA 267 or Central Rivers come and work with our committee, which really consists of one person from each building from each grade level. So it was like a 42-member team that really has been working on this, too. Um, and then in 2016, um, we continued that work, actually, with AEA a couple more times that year and wanted to, you know, experience it. And so they did a really good job um, with the AEA of um, providing those opportunities for us to experience what it means to learn in that inquiry-based level and such. We've also had a ton of our teachers, and I wish, Pam, that we actually had a count of all of them that have taken some incredible classes at UNI, too, that have been um, really um, mind-shifting for everybody. And then towards the end of um, the year last year, we had been exploring different um, publishers. We didn't really want a textbook. We knew we needed to have something that was going to help us to make some of those shifts, too. We even looked at exploring writing our own units um, at the elementary level. That was a little bit tougher with all of the other things that our teachers are teaching. And so um, we knew we probably needed a resource, and we came across STEM scopes. One of the things that we really liked about STEM scopes um, at that time, too was that it gave us the framework that was going to help shift the instruction. It wasn't just about the content. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as well. Um, we know we still have some work to do. This year, it's been exciting to see what's been happening, and I'm going to share a couple examples in a second. Um, we really just required teachers dive in, and they had decided last spring as, as grade level teams what they were going to focus on this year. Um, many have gone above and beyond of, of what the expectation was that they found value in it and have continued with that. Um, there's so much, like a textbook, there's so much in there, we have to pare it down, and so we'll continue to do that work next year with that committee um, and give them some time to work on that. Um, here's part of the framework that I was uh, talking about that it gave to us. Um, it, 
it's called the 5e kind of a lesson planning framework and basically what it has done for us is it's helped us to learn that we don't have to front load everything once upon a time back when i was teaching science it was all about give them all the facts and then pretty soon you give them that um, experiment that they're going to do and they basically follow the recipe and sure enough it proved everything you just told them so it's it's entirely different there's a lot of opportunity for kids to be engaged to um, do lots of exploring and that's a really cool thing for the kids um, and then explaining elaborating and evaluating and it's not just evaluation of, of their content knowledge but it's the process as well um, there was a glitch in the video that got sent over the weekend um, so I will send this out to you because this is one of uh, incredible teachers she's been on the committee this is Hannah Morgan from Cedar Heights and I'll make sure you all have this because it's incredible what she has to say and she talks about she hits on a lot of these um, words up here that are part of what we call the four C's and it's you know preparing our kids for jobs that we don't even know what they're going to be just yet and so uh, she talks about the collaboration and the creativity that these kids have and one of the things that she says in there that is probably so poignant is um, she talks about those kids that maybe aren't necessarily the leaders in the class on the surface how they have opportunities to really shine in this too and so that's awesome can't wait for you to listen to that um, Inquiry is incredible in this. Um, one of the things that sometimes maybe inquiry gets a bad name is that it's sort of a free for all, and it's absolutely not. It is so planned and purposeful. I watch these kids, um, you know, come up with a written plan. They even had to budget for how they were going to make their creation, and so there was some math integrated into this project. Um, this happened to be a third grade class, as well, and uh, so really cool to see how they're integrating those skills. Um, again, I can't emphasize this part of it enough. The collaboration has been incredible. Um, and it's so funny, the picture on the far right, this little girl, she was definitely playing the role of the mediator um, because it was a couple of them really struggling to get along. But I tell you what, this group worked it out. It was amazing. I wish I could have um, captured this and shown it to everybody. This would be a great thing for you guys to come visit sometime too. Um, cooperation, this is another little snippet clip that you'll get to see when we send that out um, a little bit later tonight too. This little gal, she did another great job of kind of mediating and saying, nope, I think we can do this, and they came up with their little conclusion, so that was fantastic. Um, really hits at a lot of those skills that I think it's not just the content that's important, but it's so much about the process of um, learning and how we work together and problem solve that makes a difference. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to share too is that we knew also for elementary teachers we would need to have some ongoing support. Um, we've, you know, obviously engaged in some PD. Um, several of our teachers have gone through the training at UNI, um, but there needed to be something right there on the spot. And each of the units in STEM um, scopes has um, some videos that help bring to light some of the. Um, misconceptions that kids might have and so teachers have a little bit of that um, heads up before it even happens in case they need to redirect the ship a little bit too so that was an excellent um, resource within this as well and so we just have been really excited I have noticed tons of excitement from the teachers as far as this is great we're moving more as a as a whole system rather than some of the pet projects that we might have had before we adopted something new so any questions Questions from the board. And so sorry the video didn't come through because it was really the heart of my my. I think Janelle said she was going to just send it to us right now. Send it right now. Yeah. Perfect. So, well, <laughs> thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. I mean, yeah. I, I, this this is what it's all about, and I, it gives me goosebumps to listen to you talk as we move forward, as you move forward, and all the hard work and dedication that you've put into this. Um, thank you because. It's for the kids, and it's for all the right reasons. Um, and, and we can see it in your faces. So. Passion shines through, certainly. Yeah. Can I ask a general question, probably for Dan and Pam, maybe? So we, we are talking tonight somewhat about maybe changing the elementary schedule to allow some more collaboration for grade level teams. We heard from our science team that had a great goal to meet, so we're getting that cross-grade meeting. What is the way or what is the support, the support we can give as a board that we are encouraging that to continue past just setting your science standards so that that is happening 
on a more regular basis, not only cross-grade, but maybe cross-curricular? I mean, are there ways that, I know there are so, only so many hours in the day and we only have so many PD days, but are there, is there anything we can be doing as a board or a district that will facilitate more of that kind of collaboration between Sure, our teachers would say more teachers, more yeah. money. <laughs> We'd all like to see that. Okay. But <laughs> Let's vote. I, think the, I do think the board and the community has given us a lot of support, though, by having the early dismissals and the late starts. That's a gift that a lot of districts don't have. And during that time, we do a lot of collaboration. Yeah, I think we also try to do some um, substitute days where we have some of our departments that will meet collectively together during the days because that, it's so important to have that dialogue and conversation collectively. We've said this so many times that our teachers are the experts. They need to get together to be able to talk through some of these components to look at best practices and then the impacts on students. And we're, we're trying to have that vertical articulation, that uh, cross-curricular articulation. It's challenging, uh, but there's ways it's being done. We're always looking at ways to do it better, um, but it's certainly it's a testament to our staff to, to be able to have the conversations that are ongoing right now for student learning. I think the tough part is that, you know, a lot of times the PD that you want or the collaboration you want does have to come out of a class time, and so you, that's, not, uh, that's not favorable to try to pull teachers out of the classroom so they can collaborate, and that's where the Monday mornings and the Wednesday afternoons work so well. Uh, we also have teachers that are willing to do work over the summer, and, and uh, we have some funding available for that, but it's not nearly enough. And so I know that our people are putting a lot more time and effort in than we can ever compensate them for. And, and that's just a dedication that our teachers have to, to do the work. So uh, the support you've been given, it's been very much appreciated. We'll continue to try to support our teachers and staff as much as we can. And, uh, and fortunately, we've got people that are willing to, to do the work because they know it's best for kids. Thank you, Dan. Thank you again for all you're doing for our kids. We appreciate it. Okay, moving on to item J on the agenda, approval of a two-year extension to the auditor bid. Mr. Nisker, did I miss something? Oh, sorry. Oh, you know what? Mine is, my, I have, I'm gonna back up. So on, now it's going to be approval of the Cedar Falls High School portable Bid, project bid. I have an old well, we, uh, Brian Sanderman from Envision Architects is going to join us and uh, we do have a uh, couple of PowerPoint slides we want to throw up on the screen. Um, just to make sure that everybody sort of knows where, what's going to happen here, uh, this is a, a Google Earth is a wonderful thing mm -hmm. occasionally and uh, you can see this is the north end of the high school, the parking lots on the uh, far north and the Division Street is what you see on the right. The blue rectangle uh, that you see in the center of the screen more or less is a representative of where the uh, portable classroom from Southdale would, would eventually end up uh, being located. So the, the, hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of, of exactly where that's going to where that's going to be sitting. Uh, with all due respect to uh, Brian's uh, team, uh, maybe this shows a little bit better than what he's able to do uh, on his uh, blueprint drawings. And so if you just want to go to the other slide, uh, uh, we'd, I'll let Brian walk through the uh, bid results and the recommendation. All right, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, we, got, we got one bid from Cook Construction. Uh, the bid came in at 161,878, as you see there. The estimate kind of budget that we had developed previously was in the range of 150,000 to 165. So it came well within that. Uh, so that was good to see, um, especially since we only received one bid. Um, we've recommended to go ahead with Cook Construction and open that bid. Um, they have worked with the district before. They've recently done stuff, I know, at North Cedar with portables. And Doug and, and Rick um, said they did a very, very good job there, very responsive, good to work with. So um, very capable group. Um, so definitely recommend to move forward with them. Um, the other thing, one of the questions might be, why didn't we get more bids? We had a few that were interested that came to the pre-bid, um, but as we found out, we talked to them a little bit. Some of them just got other jobs, and this is a smaller project, so a little harder to get them. It's in the summertime. Um, so folks just, I think, had a few other things that came on their plate during the bidding, um, bidding of this, so that's why we only got one, it sounds like, so. And I would comment to the board that uh 
We have accepted a single bid in the past, so this wouldn't be the first time we've done that. Uh, I am very comfortable with the recommendation with Cook Construction. Again, as Brian commented, they did the work for us at North Cedar last year with the foundations and all the work for the two portable classrooms. They were their excellent firm to work with, and um, uh, would look, we look forward to working with them again this summer. Thank you. One of the comments that I'd make as well is sometimes we get questions about maybe a need for a portable, and, and you know a question might be framed like in 1973, we had 500 students that graduated from the Cedar Falls High School. Why do we need portable spaces now? And what I would, you know, again, this is more information for our community, but so also a reminder for our board members, um, education's changing. As we just heard, too, with our science standards, the inquiry base, the experimentation, the opportunities for kids to collaborate and, and have critical thinking. Spaces are different than what we had with 35 students sitting in rows and desks 40, 45 years ago. We need bigger spaces for kids to be able to have those experiences. You know, back in, in the early 70s, that is before even the IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, um, right now we have about 20 classrooms at the high school dedicated to help serve students that might have some um, disabilities or some disadvantages that they were not served in public education back in the 1973, 1974. We have so many college level courses and, and classes that weren't in existence. Community colleges weren't in existence at that time frame that are embedded within the curriculum. We have computer courses, project lead the way courses, other opportunities for students. Our curriculum has expanded exponentially in that time frame. Our need for different spaces have grown exponentially in that time frame. The uh, ability to have, again, those 30 to 35 students sitting in desks in rows, we know that's not best practice. We know we need to have engagement and activity and, and deeper level learning. That's why in 1973, we might have been able to put 1,400 students in that building. In this day and age, it's just not feasible, possible, or we don't have the space to be able to accommodate that. I think there's probably, you know, probably 20% of the, the usable space at the high school currently is programs that didn't exist when the high school was first opened. So, um, I just wanted to address that because that's a question that's sometimes raised. And again, the context from 1973 to today is so much different. It's dramatically different. The, the focus and in, in the, the course expectation, the engagement level of students, dramatically different. Thank you, Brian. Do I have a motion, Jeff, to approve the portable bid? I move that the Cedar Falls Community School District Board of Education approve the Cedar Falls High School portable project with a bid of $161,878 from Cook Construction of Cedar Falls. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you, Brian. I'll just add. Chim Zim with our project, he said he worked with Envision. It was great. Um, did a great job. Those, those guys are amazing. So, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for your involvement with CAPS as well. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the approval of the two-year extension of the auditor's bid. Uh, that would be me again. Um, uh, the, the district uh, has a, uh, three years ago, approved a, a contract with Carney Alexander for auditing services. Within that uh, contract, there was an option for a two-year extension. And uh, in your packet, uh, uh, you have the information for that two-year extension. Uh, the district uh, paid $19,900 for auditing services for the school year that uh, just ended, the 16-17 school year. Uh, the fee for the 2017-18 uh, school year would be 20400 and for the uh, 2000. 18-19 school year would be 20,900. So it's very similar fee schedule that's been in the past. I think you know that uh, based on um, comments that we made at the last board meeting uh, from the business office, we're very pleased with the work that and the cooperation we get from Carney Alexander. But it is the board's auditor, and so um, I will leave it up to you as how you want to move forward. Thank you, Doug. Do I have a motion to approve the auditor, auditor bid? I move that the Cedar Falls Community School District Board of Education approve a two-year contract extension to Kearney, Alexander, Martold, and Company for auditing services. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded by Eric. Uh, any questions or comments? Has, it, has Cedar Falls 
used this uh, auditing firm for more than a couple of years, or is this, is this you know? They have been, um, as long as I've been here, they have been the auditing firm. Um, recently, right before I came, there was a switch for a couple of years where they went to a different firm and then went back. I will tell you that finding firms to do school district audits is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, we constantly have uh, school districts that are contacting us wanting to know who are you using for an auditor because our auditor retired or they've decided that they're not going to do school audits anymore. And so from that perspective, it's become a little bit more difficult, um, not even thinking about the cost or the fee associated to have that work performed. We know they're extremely thorough. They, they know our district and they're able to come in and be able to do the work uh, efficiently, but it takes several pre-audit days and then several actual audit days on site. And, and it's an extensive amount of, of work that they do for us as a district as well as for our community. And to, to give you an idea, they will come in June and uh, they will be in our office two to three days to do the pre-audit, so what we affectionately call it. And then they, in August, uh, they're back and they're typically there about three and a half to four days doing the actual field work in the audit. And then from that time, that helps us file our certified annual report. Um, one of the great pleasures of working with Carney Alexander is we're getting that audit paper done and we're filing the audit, certified audit, certified annual report. We don't have to worry about audit adjustments a year later. Uh, some school districts have that constantly. We report this, but a year later we're making an adjustment to your CAR and, and we're not having to do that, so that's a real benefit to us. And uh, they're always there to answer those questions that we have during the course of the year. And being in town, or in Waterloo, excuse me, it's extremely convenient and helpful. So when somebody asks, do you work during the summer? Yes, we do. And, and there's a lot of wrap up of the fiscal year and different components, so there is activity happening. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we're going to vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Moving on, you're on again to item L on the agenda, the approval of the bus purchase. Yep. Uh, one last time, if mm -hmm. we can pull the screen. There we go. Um, if you'll recall, uh, when we uh, the board approved the purchase of two new buses back in January, made the comment that we were going to have to uh, look at uh, adding a couple of additional buses. To make a long story short, uh, we had uh, two buses that basically fell down on top of themselves due to rust issues. And so they're out of service. And we already have a, a lot of difficulty in the spring and the fall of the year with uh, having buses available to take uh, teams on athletic trips out of town. Uh, we had we commented earlier about the cost the district's incurring for charter services because of all of that. And so uh, we have been on the market uh, looking for a couple of buses to come off lease. Um, and we have found from a couple of different firms a couple of options. Uh, the first option would be from School Bus Sales in Waterloo, Iowa. This would be uh, for two 65 passenger uh, diesel engine buses. You can see uh, the, the mileage on those two buses. and what the cost is per unit. Uh, they, these buses are um, very, very, very similar to what we spec on an annual basis for a conventional bus. And so they would fit right in uh, to our, um, our fleet. As a matter of fact, they happen to be um, coming from the same school district that we bought a couple of lease buses from two years ago. Just so happens to work out that way. The other option we have is as we went out and looked for bids, we, uh, Thomas Bus Sales out of Waterloo has a couple of buses available. Uh, one's a year older, as you can see, it's a 2015. Uh, the, probably the bigger difference from these is that they're not air ride suspension, they're more of the traditional uh, uh, coil spring uh, ride. Not to say that that's bad or that's good, but in our, in our school district, our entire fleet's a, uh, air ride or air brake type uh, system where with these buses, they would be spring coil right and they'd be hydraulic brakes instead of air brakes. Uh, hydraulic brakes are a higher maintenance cost uh, because you're having to change pads and do things more often than you would with air ride. You can see the mileage for the two buses and the cost and that uh, ironically, the cost for those, these buses, which we would think that they maybe would be a little less expensive is actually more than what school bus sales is uh, offering to their two units for. 
So our recommendation to the board would be to uh, purchase uh, the, the two uh, 2016 model year school buses from school bus sales. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, they're 57850 a piece. To give you an idea, two years ago we bought a brand new conventional and that was at 81000 So that you can kind of see what the savings is over that. Uh, those buses will be in our fleet um, in April, just in time for them to be put on the road for all the uh, activities that take place across the district with kids for the sp uh, spring sporting events. And uh, we did uh, budget $315,000 in the Pepple Fund out of next school year for, for buses. Remember, we bought two transits instead of three earlier. So it comes out to be literally a wash when we get all done. I'm just sort of taking a little bit of the head, but then the buses for next year will be that'll be it, and so it'll come out in the end. Of, in the end, that'll be basically the same amount of money, just a little bit more this year and a little bit less next year. Okay. As we talked about a couple months ago. We have a great challenge in our district. We have a lot of students involved with activities. We've been using some charter buses just due to the fact that we don't have the bus fleet to be able to handle all of the different transportation needs. This adds and, and certainly expands our fleet to be able to help cut down on some of those expenditures. <coughs> All right, any other questions? I just wanted to know, as leased buses, do they come with um, warranties? Ex ex they warranties? will come with a, a short period warranty, something like 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with uh, school bus sales, if there's an issue, they're going to back us on that. But they do come with a, basically a 90-day warranty. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the bus bid? I move that the Cedar Falls Community School District Board of Education approve the bid from school bus sales, Waterloo, Iowa, in the amount of $115,700 for two 2016 Bluebird 65 passenger buses with air ride suspension. Thank you, Sasha. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded by Jenny. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, Doug. Moving on now to M, Superintendent's Report. Just a couple different items. Uh, we have a special board meeting March 7th at 4 p.m. to look at and award the furniture bid that will be here in the, at this location. Um, and then March 26th will be our next uh, official regular board meeting that will be the discussion with preliminary budget to go over those budgetary numbers as we look at uh, finalizing a budget for April in the state timeline April 15th. Um, it's going to be uh, exciting next few weeks of, of the school year and then we do have spring break just so everybody's aware and then uh, certainly as we look at the end of the school year it'll come quickly uh, over the course of the next several months. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Patti? Andy, can you just give us um, a brief overview of what's still happening in the legislature that you know would be pertinent to our district? I mean, one I, one thing I did wonder is with our school calendar, is there any talk of still? They were talking about possibly that's dead. That part is dead. That's that's yes, dead. Uh, there was a discussion about going with the first Monday following the state fair, and we found out when we were down there during the legislative uh, day. Um, that was something that there was just not a political will to have a discussion about at this time. Uh, they said that we've talked school calendars, we're not going to move forward with school calendar discussion. August 23rd is the date when we can officially start, no, no sooner. I think some of the other larger legislative items, uh, the save extension, the one cent sales tax, extremely important for our district. It is uh, passed out of the uh, House, there's the exact language in the Senate, we just need to continue to advocate the importance of that, what it means for our students and, and certainly as, as, as a future for us as we look at some of those needs with, with our high school. Um, you know, there's several different bills that are being uh, still considered. Um, there, the transportation equity is still on, on the table, that does not have an impact for us locally. There's the discussion still with SSA because there's disagreements with what that looks like and what's entailed within that final supplemental state aid bill um, and that will go to a conference committee so we'll have to see how that progresses. The, the voucher bill and then the board has done a tremendous job advocating their position on that is not, did not uh, live through funnel and did not come out of committee so I think that's very appreciative. And then finally I think the most important bill that we're trying to watch and, and observe right now is assessment and there was uh, much work at the state level about 
what was the assessment and what that assessment would be for our systems across the state and, and committees met they recommended a going with a certain um, company for that and the legislature got involved and said no don't go with that company open it back up for RFPs another committee met they recommended a, a finally a different company and, and now the legislature decided to have a bill that came out of the house um, and passed the house that said we would go with only one assessment that we've gone with in the past and there's a question whether or not that's aligned to our standards as we heard earlier this evening and how important those are. So that's a little bit uh, nebulous at this time. It's going into the House, excuse me, the Senate Education Committee tomorrow, I believe at 1030 in the morning, maybe 11 in the morning, to have some discussion. And I know there's advocacy going on across the state to help um, that go back maybe to the role that it should be with the Department of Education advocating and talking about what are the best aligned assessments for students and for schools instead of that being made at the legislative level. I believe, don't we also have a uh, tax reformation bill that's on the table that's moving through pretty quickly? Oh yeah, uh, thank you for that. And, and that uh, right now is, is a very significant bill. We don't know the exact language. I've not seen the language of the bill, but there's a potential yeah, tax uh, bill that could um, reduce maybe the revenues for the state up to, to $1 billion, and, and that has significant impact on local school districts, what we can offer, and um, we've not seen a great amount of detail on that, at least I have not, but certainly that's um, been out there as a, an idea. I read today that that's about 137 pages in length, but again, I'm not sure that the document's actually been released for, for public consumption, at least I have not seen it. So and there has not been a legislative services uh, action to determine what actually is the cost of that um, tax bill. So yes, there is several important components on the table that we just need to be cognizant of and certainly advocate for. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Petty? So when does, do we vote on the calendar one more time? Next What's meeting, the, March next 26, meeting? Okay. we will ask the board to approve the calendar and, and that way we can move forward with yep. publicizing that. And the special session is only to approve the furniture bid to expedite that process, correct? Correct. That way we can move forward with that and have that extra two weeks to be able to get those furniture components ordered and, and certainly have those in place by June. We've come to realize, and we've known this for a long time, the turnaround for those furniture components are, you know, three, four, sometimes five months. And we just want to make sure that that extra two weeks gives us the, the proper time to have furniture in our spaces. Very good. <laughs> It is here yep. and be televised. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments or concerns from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. I move that the Cedar Falls Board of Education enter into closed session to evaluate the professional competency of an individual whose appointment, hiring, performance, or discharge is being considered when necessary to prevent needless and irreparable injury to that individual's reputation, and that individual requests a closed session 2017 Code of Iowa 21.51I. Thank you, Jenny. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Eric. It's a roll call, it's a roll call vote. vote. Um, Mrs. Coyle? Yes. Mr. Giddens? Yes. Mrs. Hines? Yes. Mrs. Leeper? Yes. Mr. Orvis? Yes. And Mrs. Wolpert? Yes. Okay. Um, we will now uh, be adjourning into closed session. This will end the district's broadcast for today. When we come out of closed session, we, the board will then immediately adjourn. Thank you.